I think we are here. I want to welcome everyone to the 2020 annual membership meeting of the Everest Station District Alliance, ESDA. Um, we're going to get started. Um, this is a great, the membership meeting is a great opportunity to reflect on the past year and look towards the, the next year. Um, and we have a couple of action items. So I'm going to go over our agenda real quick. Um, just as a, just so everybody's aware, we are recording the, the meeting um, for posterity and um, also for note taking abilities uh, in the future. Um, so our agenda for today is to um, first a welcome um, to everybody. Um, I'm going to put up a poll on the screen um, and then if you could sign in uh, by writing your name um, and potentially your organization, that'd be great. Um, as well as, uh, oh, I got to do something. Hmm. Okay. So if you could, yeah, sign in and then complete the, the initial poll on the, um, I think it should be up on the screen now. I'm not sure if you can see it, uh, but hopefully you can. Um, and then get a sense of who's all here, where you're from. And with your name, if you could uh, write in what you're looking most forward to um, once COVID-19 is all over. And I should, I should probably uh, do this myself so everybody. All right, while you're all doing that, I'll go over the rest of the agenda here. So first, we have a panel discussion with uh, leaders of um, four business districts uh, that will be facilitated by our very own uh, Sheldon Johnson here, uh, the general manager of the Delta Hotel. Um, I will provide a, a recap of 2020 of accomplishments and things that have happened in the neighborhood. Um, provide a progress update on the convergence at Everett Station study that we've been assisting with over uh, this fall, provide an update on our financial statements, um, as well as our 2021 budget and our draft priorities for the next year, which will get approved, uh, both of those get approved at our January board meeting. And then finally, we have membership votes for um, a value statement that we've been working on pretty much all year for the organization and uh, our new slate of board members uh, for our next three-year term of 2020 to 2023. So that is our uh, outline of our agenda. Um, I'm seeing some good uh, comments in the chat. Feel free to continue to engage on the chat throughout the meeting and ask questions uh, there. Um, and yep, so. First off, I want to thank uh, several uh, contributors uh, within uh, to the ESDA over the last year, including Auto Truck Services, Glacier Properties, NJM uh, Partners, um, the Petersons, Greg Tisdell, uh, WW Wells Millwork, um, Sharing Wheels, um, and uh, Community Transit and Sound Transit, who have each per, uh, helped us financially over the last year. So thank you for your sponsorships. And I, I think we're already a little ahead schedule, so I'm excited about that. I'll take this brief moment before moving on to the panel discussion, just kind of highlight um, the, the poll results. 
where we're all from. So uh, almost a third of us uh, are property owners in the district. Um, nearly a quarter are, have businesses. Uh, a fifth are government or public agencies. Um, a quarter are nonprofit or social service uh, NGOs. And then um, we have a few people, representative uh, city neighborhood associations, um, and then a few folks just here either by themselves or other. Um, where do people live? Um, most people, uh, a plurality of people live uh, in Everett, but not in the neighborhood. 27% um, outside uh, of Everett, but in Snohomish County and 33% outside of Snohomish County altogether. And finally, um, how much are you looking forward to being COVID over? Uh, obviously, this was, a, this was an easy one. Um, it looks like one person really enjoys the Zoom meetings. And I know I do enjoy the Zoom meetings and will be sad to go, but I'll also be happy that COVID is over. So thank you all for engaging on that. Um, we have uh, a couple more polls later as well to continue to engage. With that, I would like to introduce our panel um, of Sheldon Johnson, the general manager of Delta Hotel, who will facilitate the panel. Uh, Liz Stinning, um, our executive director of the Downtown Everett Association here in Everett. Um, Aaron Goodman, executive director of the Soto BIA. Don Blakeney of uh, the Downtown Seattle Association and Chris Word Woodward of the Alliance for Pioneer Square. I think this is gonna be a great opportunity to look at- what um, uh, what accomplishments they've had over uh, the past, uh, what they're looking forward in the future, and how they wrestle with COVID, and I think really illuminate what's possible here in our neighborhood. I'm going to give a quick overview, and just kind of orient folks on a map. Um, so this is a map of the Downtown Everett Association's uh, area. Um, I think they're about to expand it by a couple by a block or two, uh, potentially. Um, but this gives a, a general indication. This is downtown from Pacific on the south end um, to Everett on the north end um, on, as the main line going across. And then the other districts, uh, which are all in Seattle. Um, downtown Seattle Association takes the, the bulk of the center city. Uh, Alliance for Pioneer Square, obviously Pioneer Square, the orange, and then Soto BIA, the uh, industrial area uh, south of downtown. And so with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to Sheldon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's start with Liz and tell us a little bit about um, your organization and um, kind of your purpose and programs and priorities that you do. Put my name on it. Great, thank you. Uh, so my name is Liz Stenning. Uh, I started working with the Downtown Everett Association last March, which was a really fantastic time to start the new position. Uh, before that, I, I worked with the Alliance for Pioneer Square with Chris for several years and also collaborated with Don and Aaron at their organizations. So at the Downtown Everett Association, like Brock mentioned, we, are, um, we follow the footprint of our BIA, which is 38 blocks in the center of the downtown. And like he mentioned, we border the Everett Station District there on Broadway. Our mission is that we're striving to create a healthy, vibrant urban downtown core. I'll just highlight a few of our programs. Uh, we manage the BIA. The primary work we do with that um, is that we operate a clean team. This is actually new for us. For about 15 years, we had a, an outside contractor that did this work. So now as of this fall, we have our own employees and we're, we launched that this fall. Uh, that's been uh, a good experience, definitely challenging, but we're, we're happy to have our own uh, folks out there. We also operate the city's own, the city owned parking garage called Ever Park. And we have 11 employees, some part time, some full time. We're split between the office and the field. Most of our crew is working out in the field or in the garage. Starting in 2021, we have become an official Main Street community. So some of you may be familiar with Main Street. It's a national movement. There are thousands of organizations around the country. There's about 35 to 40 in Washington state and we're a new organization. So that's exciting because we'll receive more technical support and more mentorship for our programs. 
some of the programs that we uh, that we work on uh, various events like Halloween or holiday shopping uh, guide. We partner with the city on various events. We also partner with different different partners that run their own organ own events like the farmers market, for instance. Uh, we provide small business support in a variety of ways. And then new th new this year, we have a couple um, a couple of things you may have heard that we we took over the city run flower program, and this was primarily because of budget cuts. Well, mostly all because of budget cuts. And we were able to step in the last minute and resurrect the program and keep it going, which we're excited to continue in future years as well. We also started a holiday lighting program. We were able to do some, add some modest lights downtown this year, and we're hoping to do some more fundraising and be able to add to that um, in, in the coming years. So that's just a little bit about us and I'm happy to answer questions later. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Liz. Okay, Aaron, about the same thing. You can tell us a little bit about your organization and some of your priorities and uh, programs. Sure. So my name is Aaron Goodman. I'm the executive director of the Soto Business Improvement Area. And as you saw from the map, we represent the industrial area from the stadiums in the north to South Hudson Street and from the Port of Seattle to uh, I-5. And within that that geography, we have a really diverse group of businesses from, you know, traditional manufacturing and transportation to uh, startups and tech and a lot of artists and maker spaces, uh, industrial supply, the school district, the government is a large portion, but we're a relatively young BIA. We were originally founded in 2014. And so one of our main um, priorities over the past year, of past five years is to do a reauthorization. Our original um, ordinance uh, was, allowed us to go for five years. And so in 2019, I'm pleased to say that not only did we renew our authorization, but we did a significant expansion to the boundaries you see now, basically incorporating all of what is generally considered SOTO. And what we do for SOTO is we advocate for a safe, clean, and moving SOTO. So our work plan focuses on clean and safe activities, uh, transportation advocacy, and something that we, uh, business community development. Soto being an industrial area and extremely large, we represent a little over 1200 businesses, um, and is that we provide opportunities for businesses to get to know other Soto businesses, and that informs our advocacy. Uh, we do advocacy on items within our work plan, primarily in the past years, it has been around safety um, and impacts from our area's homeless crisis and drug crisis. Um, and so we do SOTO, I mean, SOTO wide advocacy on a city and government level, but we also do what I call business navigation of government, uh, which is helping individual businesses with individual issues we do street sweeping, sidewalk cleaning, and illegal dumping cleanup on demand. We have a significant contract with the Seattle Police Department to provide additional patrol hours in our district. Um, and we also do um, murals and public art. Uh, over the past five years, we have done over 72 murals. If you've ever ridden the light rail from the airport into downtown, you will see uh, the what we call the Soto Track. That was a partnership between us and For Culture, which is King County's Art uh, Public Development Authority. And additionally, we have wrapped all of our signal boxes with art and wayfinding. So trying to bring some beauty into a neighborhood that isn't historically or, or architecturally significant. Um, but right now, our businesses really primarily need us to advocate for them. And so that has been our, our primary focus for this year. And I think I'll stop there and go to at, answer questions when they come up. Thank you, Aaron. How about Chris? You wanna tell us a little bit about your organization? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Woodward. I'm the business development director with the Alliance for Pioneer Square. I use a he, him pronouns just for FYI there. Um, <clears throat> so the Alliance for Pioneer Square, our mission is to preserve what makes Pioneer Square the most authentic, engaging, and dynamic neighborhood in Seattle. And we do this uh, through a variety of different programs, including business development, communications and marketing, 
advocacy, public realm, and leadership. Um, you know, we work with, really closely with Aaron and the Soto BIA, as well as Don and the DSA team. We also manage the Pioneer Square BIA, um, which covers over 900 businesses, including our ground floor retail mix, as well as upper floor businesses. And we are the oldest BIA in the city, um, which was formed in the 80s. And kind of the signature piece of the BIA in Pioneer Square is our flower baskets, which line many of the streets in the neighborhood. A um, couple of our priorities, um, current priorities include creating, building, and sustaining partnerships with various organizations that touch Pioneer Square, supporting the existing businesses in the neighborhood and keeping an eye on recruitment for new businesses, promoting Pioneer Square as an arts and cultural destination, and fostering connections to the waterfront, uh, the Seattle waterfront and the Chinatown International District. And finally, promoting residential development in the neighborhood. So that's a little bit of snapshot about the Alliance for Pioneer Square. All right, thank you, Chris. And last but not least, Don. Good morning or good afternoon at this point. Uh, good to see everybody here. Um, my name is Don Blakeney. I'm the um, Vice President of Advocacy and Economic Development for the Downtown Seattle Association. I've been with DSA for about five years now, almost six. And uh, before that, I was working as the Executive Director for the Chinatown International District BIA in Seattle, just to the south end of downtown touching Soto. And that's how I came to know Aaron Goodman and, and the folks in Pioneer Square originally. And then before that, I, I had grown up in Seattle, but I worked for the Times Square Alliance in New York City, which is another business improvement area. A um, little bit about DSA. Uh, DSA is, um, it, it's a, a representative of downtown Seattle, and it was formed in 1958 as an advocacy organization for the center city of Seattle. And uh, at the time, Northgate was taking off and Bellevue was taking off. And uh, they thought that, you know, the property owners and retailers in downtown thought that actually the center city of Seattle needed a group to advocate on its behalf in order to have investment and continued prosperity. So we got together and ad uh, advocated for the arts and for sports and for housing to take place in downtown Seattle. Um, there wasn't a lot of housing to begin with. And uh, we created some new zoning that allowed for increased housing. We realized that we needed affordable housing. So we created uh, the um, housing resources group that has uh, kind of blossomed and spun off into Bellwether Housing, which is one of the largest housing, affordable housing providers in Washington state now. And um, in the 90s, we realized that a lot of other neighborhoods uh, were creating business improvement districts to uh, have enhanced cleaning services and, uh, and marketing services. And so we created the Metropolitan Improvement District, which is about a 285 block um, business improvement district. So kind of bigger than a lot of um, ones that you usually see nationally. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a big operation to clean all those streets every day. Um, but, uh, but that's just a part of our function. We have that. And then we also do the advocacy still for downtown Seattle. Realizing that there's a lot of um, congestion um, associated with all the growth that we've had in our center city, we created a uh, kind of a transit demand management organization called Commute Seattle, originally called Urban Mobility Group. And this group works with different employers to help uh, uh, to help encourage uh, people to take light rail and and bus service uh, to get into downtown, so we don't have as much congestion with single occupancy vehicles. Um, and we've been able to get our um, our single occupancy driving rate down uh, uh, below thirty percent. I think now down to twenty five percent, which is pretty remarkable over the last twenty years. Um, we, after creating the mid, we also uh, looked at some of the other issues that we needed to solve in downtown Seattle, including our parks, and worked with Pioneer Square Alliance and also the Waterfront Group and the Seattle Parks Foundation and created an urban parks partnership whereby we hire employees that can actually activate and beautify the parks on a regular basis with new programming and safety services. And um, it's been a great way to see new people come in and use the park. We bring in food trucks and all sorts of activations, yoga classes, um, dancing events. And it's been great, you know, obviously in non-COVID times, uh, but also some things we can do still in COVID times. Um, Lastly, we uh, have also developed a homeless outreach team uh, that does uh, work with reaching out to people who are unhoused in downtown Seattle um, to try to connect them with housing and services. And uh, it's an ongoing challenge that we face. Our team's about eight people big. And I guess I would say if I had to summarize kind of the work that we're doing, you know, uh, we're advocating on behalf of the 12 neighborhoods in downtown Seattle. And we are, um, we are really looking at the intersection between public realm, transportation, and economic prosperity. And I think as we're going to get into this conversation today, we're going to see there's a lot of opportunity as we continue to invest in major uh, public infrastructure like transportation to leverage that to make a, a really exciting uh, urban and dynamic urban environment that uh, not only attracts residents and visitors, but also jobs. And so I'm um, excited to hear more about what other people are thinking on this topic today. Thank you, Don. So I haven't seen any questions come up. So I'm going to throw one out to start for the panel. We'll start with Liz. Um, 
So for your organization and then for you, so it's kind of a two part, what are your top successes that you've had and your organizations had during your tenure or in the last 10 years for your organization? And just the top couple and why you're proud of those successes. So we'll start with Liz. Sure, yeah, I, I think one huge success uh, certainly this year and, and over the last few years has bring, bringing in more community, uh, more volunteers. Uh, just this last year, like I mentioned, we started this flower program within like a month. We really had no idea what we were doing and we relied on volunteers. I think we had about 60 volunteers that maintained the planters throughout the summer. And we also had this outpouring of people who came to plant and it was just, it was quite quite incredible uh, to see so many people come out. And I think a lot of these folks, they're a combination of residents downtown, but also we have a lot of surrounding neighborhoods where people live and they, they really want to invest in the downtown. So that community involvement is huge. And I think that for several years, the organization has been striving to become a Main Street organization. And that for our organization has been a huge achievement to be able to, to do that and um, start really start in full force next year like I mentioned, a lot of our work has been around cleaning and, and keeping the downtown safe and, and running the parking garage. And this Main Street status really allows us to expand our programs and we'll be able to have some new funding streams with that as well. So. I do have a question for you, Liz. Uh, do you have any residential in Soto? Is it zoned for what? And do you have resistance from residential? So for me, okay. So Zoto is not zoned for residential. Um, we do have residents. We have a couple of artists live work buildings. And we also have what are called caretaker apartments uh, that are allowed. Um, this is a hot topic right now. Currently, uh, the Seattle mayor has a a whole panel trying to kind of discuss zoning, uh, you know, and I am in a lucky position because the ordinance that created us requires me to be neutral on land use choices. <laughs> and I think that that has made me more effective because I need to work for all of my ratepayers and not be specifically beholden to developers that are trying to build housing or to you know my industrial groups. They both work with me because I'm not taking a position on this hot bed issue. Um, but what we know about Soto and what this pandemic has really shown us is that we're an industrial area. Industry has changed. So, you know, we don't have as many, um, you know, smelting and, you know, forging, but we have a lot of maker space, uh, sign shops, commercial kitchens, cannabis is huge in Soto. We have over 82 active cannabis permits that uh, include 10 legal retail, um, bakeries, processors, and growers. So that's a large industrial presence in Soto these days. Um, and I would say that, you know, like Liz, my biggest accomplishment is, is bringing that group together because, you know, when you have people that are, you know, in their work lives, maybe on the opposite side of an issue, but you can get them into a room and give them a glass of wine and say, what do we agree on? And let's focus on that. And we've been really successful in doing that over the past five years. And when I started, I came like Dawn from another BIA. I used to run the U District BIA up in the North end of Seattle. And when I came in, 90% of the people I'd talk to be like, I pay too many taxes my city should be doing this and why do we even need you and we have worked really hard over the last five years and my common response to that question is if you don't feel like you're getting enough you're not calling us enough and getting people to understand that what we're here what we can do and that they can call us and and really you know, when we did our reauthorization, the state requires 60%. We had 75% of our existing people say, yes, this is a good thing, which is pretty huge when you're asking people to pay money um, on an annual basis. So I would say that that's probably our biggest success. Okay, Erin, I got a follow up for you. How's your working relationship with the city and can you describe your relationship with the city? Sure. Um, 
we work very closely with the city from the department level to the mayor. Um, it's challenging. I mean, I have a very good relationship with the mayor's team. I have worked hard to have good relationships with city council members, even ones whose policies I don't necessarily agree with. I still have the ability to give them a, give a call. Their staff will take my call. But this year has been very, very frustrating. Um, Soto politically is more representative of the entire United States than typical Seattle voters. You have a much wider spread and we suffer with a lot of crime and a lot of impacts from the unsheltered um, population that's on our streets from drug crimes. And, you know, we have probably one of the best relationships with the Seattle Police Department. And I would say Soto gets incredible service, but there's limits to what they can do. And um, I have found it to be quite frustrating this year to be able to even get things that I used to be able to do and get, you know, some relief for some of my businesses, I'm not able to do this year. And that and that's hard. Um, so I keep a good working relationship, but I don't know that our ability, and I work with the other BIAs, we do a lot of group advocacy, our ability to move the needle has been much harder this year. Thank you, Erin. I'm going to go back to Liz. Same question. How do you, what's your working relationship with the city and can you describe how you guys work with the city? Yeah, I can say that, you know, coming from Seattle and coming into Everett, like like many of you who are in Everett, it's, it's just such a different experience. You know, it's, it's a much smaller place. Um, and I, um, we partner a lot with the city's economic development team. Um, just in, we're in frequent conversations with them and uh, work very closely with them. And I, I just feel so fortunate um, to work with them. Uh, and, you know, the city council, it seems to be, it, it, again, it's just so different from Seattle. Uh, the, the council members really are up to speed and really closely connected with a lot of the issues that are going on at Everett. Um, yeah, so I, I would say, uh, I can't say what it was like before, but this year I feel like we're, we're working with the city very closely and trying to collaborate and especially helping our businesses downtown. All right, thank you, Liz. Uh, Chris, same thing about um, kind of what you're proud of with your organization, your successes, maybe for your organization and then for you in the past few years. Right, so yeah, I think I uh, will identify kind of two public realm projects um, that have occurred in the neighborhood in the past 10 years that are worth um, speaking on. The first is the kind of revitalization of Occidental Square Park, um, one of our key public spaces in the neighborhood. And, you know, Don kind of mentioned at the top the um, urban parks projects. Um, it, it, Occidental is a great example of that. So we saw investment from Weyerhaeuser um, where they built their, new, you know, filled the new headquarters right alongside the park. Um, and with that came a nice um, first floor retail opportunity for a variety of businesses. So a couple, um, you know, primarily restaurants there. And with a partnership with the Downtown Seattle Association, that park has been incredibly activated um, since that partnership began uh, with buskers on a regular basis, uh, activities for folks to engage in, public art. Um, and, you know, right now there's beautiful lights that are hanging up there and, um, you know, it's a, still a, a beautiful place to be in. Um, looking towards the future, um, there's a new timber pavilion um, that has been built in Occidental Square Park that's going to be open to the public relatively soon, um, a covered space where all that activation can happen and the park staff can um, provide services and re resources for visitors of the park. And there's also a children's play space that's also um, soon to be opened in the park as well. Another public realm project that's worth mentioning, and I have to put on my uh, imaginary hat and then tip it to Liz, is the um, Alley Revitalization Project. Um, and so Liz was very much leading this project prior to her tenure at the Alliance for Pioneer Square. But when Liz joined our team, um, it got folded into the Alliance's book of work. And so there's two um, alleys in particular that have been refinished and kind of designed to be pedestrian pathways. Um, they're is a program to make sure the alleys are clear of trash and debris using clean, uh, clear plastic bags. And then again, looking forward, there's a variety of different develop developments in the neighborhood who are incorporating that uh, focus on alleys as a pedestrian pathway. Um, so those are kind of two public realm projects. 
Um, personally, I think uh, within my tenure at the Alliance for Pioneer Square, we've seen, um, again, success in that stakeholder engagement. And that's the stuff that I really love uh, because I think, you know, together, folks can accomplish more. Um, and again, it's both listening to folks in the neighborhood and also providing those resources and ensuring that two-way communication is really clear and super active. And um, it's a little less tangible than an, you know, an alley being repaved or a pavilion being built, but it's those partnerships that really, um, I think, drive the success of the Alliance for Pioneer Square. Thanks, Chris. I do have a follow-up. How has the changes in the SPDF, uh, the police department, affected you and your organization? Yeah, so there's, um, we had a community police team that would be in the neighborhood very often. We had two community police officers who were um, great resources, both for the Alliance, but also the businesses in the neighborhood. Um, since um, earlier this year, they've been kind of re- distributed into the SPD's workforce. Um, but we continue to have a good relationship with, um, you know, Chief Diaz, the current police chief of uh, SPD, as well as a variety of different folks in the Seattle Police Department. Particularly, they have a, a community um, crime prevention coordinator. And she's such a good resource helping our businesses, you know, design their spaces to make sure they're safe during business hours and after hours. Um, you know, being a resource and a connection to the SPD when we have public events. Um, so we have a really strong relationship with the SPD. They're, um, I would say, very high touch and open to our feedback and um, are good partners. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Don, I'm going to throw out um, to you first about your successes, and then I do want you to talk about your relationship with your organization in the police department. So yeah, happy to. Um, you know, I, I think the Urban Parks Partnership is one of the biggest success uh, stories from the center city. And that was the whole idea of it being a partnership is that we partnered with neighborhood organizations like Pioneer Square. So I think I won't cover that in great detail, but I would say that's one of the biggest wins was really be able to rethink how we invest in parks. We're seeing uh, parks that don't have that kind of investment, um, like Denny Park and Cal Anderson Park, and they have incredible challenges that without a steward and a, and a strong planning and funding and, and agreement on the solution, they just continue to suffer and, and not deliver a safe and welcoming environment. So anyways, that's one of the wins that we've had, and we're going to continue to develop that over time. I would say another example of something that I worked on with my team, and it was a partnership also, was the Third Avenue vision. And I'll throw, I'll throw that in the, I'll throw a link to it, at least in the, in the chat here. But, um, you know, the Third Avenue vision was a kind of a realization that Third Avenue is the real center spine of our downtown area. And it was also having all of the challenges that we were seeing. And we wanted to kind of, we've been advocating for public safety improvements and urban design improvements, but, you know, we wanted to really dissect that and understand and really what was going on on Third Avenue to really understand the issues at play there. And so we did an analysis. We hired a, a traffic, uh, you know, we, a transportation firm to help look at what was going on with the transportation. And what we learned is that we were moving more buses with fewer people and less sidewalk space than any city in North America, even Mexico City. Uh, we had, I think, over around 52,000 buses, a, sorry, riders a day and over 300 buses an hour. And so it was just this crazy congestion point. If you think of 300 buses an hour, like that's a lot of buses. It's a wall of diesel and, and metal. And what it was doing, it was kind of suffocating the sidewalk life. And it was also creating crowds of people waiting for their bus that would go ahead and hide other negative activity that was going on. So we started to dissect this work and look at how we could peel it apart and bring partners to the table to solve some of these problems. For years, so many of the partners owned only 10% of the, the, the stuff that's going on there. So the buses were at Metro, but they only owned their bus stop, right? They could only make that as nice as they could. You know, City Light owned the lights, um, the property owners owned their property, but it wasn't coordinated. And there was a lot of frustration that if, well, if I did my 10%, no one else is doing their 10%. So we decided that we will bring together a community conversation around how we could lean in on both the public and the private side. And we, uh, we created this third avenue vision that really tried to take advantage of the fact that we saw $500 million worth of permits on this avenue throughout downtown. And they were all making decisions and design decisions about how to interface with this avenue. If we could align that money and that investment by getting commitments from the public sector to do something a little bit different, we thought we could have a bigger impact. And so we put forward this vision and it's slowly been, you know, it got a little bit side, uh, sideways with COVID, but I think there's still a commitment to make this a really desirable corridor. There's major luxury housing that's going in, there's new public facilities going in and the light rail expansion to North Seattle will be coming through, um, comes right through here to Westlake Station, but also you have uh, 
Um, you have the new light rail line that will connect with this when it, ST3 rolls through downtown. So there's just all sorts of opportunity to capture um, the benefit of some of these major investments that are coming through. And by like, just like Chris was saying, if you can get people on the same page and really working as a team, we had about 75 people you'll see at the end of this document that have all been participating public and private sector to really try to row in the same direction. And um, you know, we have a big hole to climb out of with the, with the recession that we're gonna be facing with all of the businesses that have been closing. I think 150 have closed in downtown already, but I think coming back out, aligning on what we want to see there will be a really positive step forward as we try to rebuild this corridor and the center of our city. So how do you, how, what do you attribute to the success of you getting those 75 people or 75 organizations to really help you guys do what you need to do? You know, it was it was a lot of skepticism. We, we said, hey, can we do this? And, and then, you know, everybody had at least three copies of a third avenue plan that they'd worked on, you know, before that didn't go anywhere. So we had we had to come with kind of a mea culpa. We've been involved in half of those efforts, I imagine. And, you know, that 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 we really needed to bring more of the public sector to the table and the private sector together to kind of show what they could do in totality. And so we what we did to establish some of that um, some of that goodwill and trust at the beginning was to set up a quick wins team. And we'd been meeting with Commute Seattle. The board of Commute Seattle is all of the transit agency directors. So you have the head of Metro, head of SDOT, head of um, Sound Transit, and um, you have the head of the planning department also. And so those folks actually have a bit of uh, control over what happens along that corridor. And so we said, if we could do a quick wins effort for six months and knock out some chronic things that we've been bothered by for a long time, we'd be able to take that back to the private sector and say, hey, we're making progress. And so they committed to doing all sorts of improvements to the uh, to the boarding. They did on-door boarding, uh, all-door boarding, where you can basically tap at the curb and then you don't have to wait in line to get on the bus. You can get on any door. They rolled that out. They also um, got rid of a few useless structures that they weren't using. They were old infrastructure that was kind of sitting there, but no one had the budget to take them out. Um, SDOT and Metro worked together to get those out of the ground and, and rebuild the sidewalk again. Um, it was just great to, we, uh, we had 24 phone booths that didn't work. Um, the only thing that worked on the phone booth that said, this phone no longer works. <laughs> and, the, and the contractor had left the state, so there was no real way to get them out of the ground. Uh, SDOT came and took them out. And it was that kind of commitment to just cleaning up the environment and making a small near-term investment that really builds some goodwill with the property owners. They came to the table and then they said, well, I can do this, I can do that. Some people put new uh, lighting on their building. Some people decided to work with us on tenanting their ground floor. But it's that kind of kind of collaboration and spirit of goodwill that I think kind of ping pongs back and forth and kind of builds a coalition to actually get some of these things done. Okay. How about your relationship with the uh, Seattle Police Department? You know, so public safety, at least on Third Avenue, is a big part of that story. Um, SPD is, you know, a close partner in downtown. We hire SPD, like uh, Aaron was mentioning. We have uh, emphasis patrols that we partner with them on. I think it's going to get increasingly harder as, you know, they have less capacity um, and they have to focus on 911 response. They might not have as many resources free to work with us. But um, <clears throat> we um, just even right now, actually, um, I'm missing, but we do host a monthly meeting with downtown stakeholders and security uh, for buildings that is called the Downtown Security Forum. And we co-host that with the police department to really share information and kind of talk about trends. They also have their normal public process for talking about downtown tri uh, crime trends. But this is a little bit more focused on how we can collaborate and elevate concerns of private property owners. And then um, we've uh, also had some uh, we also hire private security to be in the parks as part of that partnership. And that's and sometimes and to some degree uh, coordinated with SPD. Um, it was one of the SPD folks that we had hired and was on duty with us that was able to get to that mass shooting that happened um, on January 20th. They were right around the corner and they were able to be there in like 30 seconds. And so, I mean, you don't want to plan for those days because they're far and few and far between, but it was nice. To, it was helpful to have that presence on, on, on the ground there when that happened. I would say that we just, we aren't in a situation where we have the foot patrols of yesteryear um, where you have cops walking around doing the kind of proactive relationship building. And we'd like to see more of that. Um, but again, I think that there's a lot of questions on what direction SPD is, is headed. Um, and I think we'd like to be there as we designed, as we work together with the city to redesign policing, like how, do, how does that work so that we address the issues like the drug market on Third Avenue, et cetera. All right, thanks, Tom. Yeah. Liz. How about um, your organization working with the Everett Police Department? Yeah, I think that we, uh, I can say that this year anyway, we work fairly closely with the, with the police department. We do have foot patrols and bike patrols and we see them often. Uh, they've frequently walked by the office here and we've get, gotten to know them by name and they're very helpful in, especially in, um, they know everyone, you know, they know everyone out there. Um, 
they will also go and speak with businesses on our behalf or, you know, there, I think that that the Everett PD has been a huge help uh, downtown. Um, and I, I, I don't really know what it was like downtown before COVID, uh, but I, what I understand is Everett Police Department has a great reputation for going through a lot of trainings and they're getting a lot of um, deep training within their police force. Uh, so uh, I also personally have had to call uh, 911 a couple times and I found that the response is very fast. Uh, and I've, I've been really, it's, I've been really impressed by their, the speed with which they can react and, and, and come. Uh, that's just my experience. Okay. In my engagement with the, the Everett Police Department, they've been amazing. When we call them, they're here. Not just one car. We usually get a couple here. And you just say, we don't really need to, but it's nice to see. Um, I do have another follow-up question for you, Liz. Um, what does Everett downtown need to become to be a preferred place to live? That's a great question. I've actually been asking people about that. <laughs> I, I, uh, I would love to do a strategic plan for downtown Everett, but I, I feel like clearly, you know, more people living downtown and there are uh, some, uh, uh, there's construction that's happening right now. There's construction happening in the future. So I think we'll be seeing more and more people downtown. I think having more businesses, whether it's retail, restaurants, and not just more businesses, but also having a real connected, a connected community of businesses. You know, I came from the Alliance for Pioneer Square like with Chris and the BIA is, um, the businesses that pay into the BIA there. So I was really used to working um, with, with all the businesses, you know, we knew, we knew all of them. And I, I, I could see downtown Everett really having a strong community amongst our businesses. Um, and then of course, transportation, you know, we have a light rail coming, it's not coming maybe as soon as we'd like, like, but it's coming. And I think having that connection to the station district and to the, you know, to light rail, which is going to be a, a, a massive, uh, massive improvement for our, all of our connected transportation. Okay. Um, Aaron, I'll start with you, but this is a question for the whole panel. Um, how does your organization address the homeless uh, situation in each of your areas? So we can start, we can start with Liz since you're here. <laughs> sure. Um, so this, uh, just this past, I would say, few months, uh, we started meeting weekly with some representatives from Snohomish County, as well as the city of Everett. And I think originally we started meeting, maybe it was once a month, and we decided to meet every week. And so we're starting to really create some synergy and, and uh, collaboration with, with the county, with the city, because for those of you who are familiar with Everett, you know that the, the, county, the county campus is downtown. Everett as well as the city facilities. And so there's uh, there's a lot of city and county owned properties. So um, it's it's been really great to um, to get to know those those services and what they're doing because I think before we started meeting regularly, we weren't as we weren't as sure as what's happening with the temporary shelter or with um, cleaning up um, downtown. And so it's I can say that we're starting to make a lot more inroads as far as understanding the situation and uh, the city of Everett has and the county have been doing a lot as far as their they have more funds available to they're looking into temporary shelters as well as long-term shelters as well as a, a whole variety of um, projects to address the homeless situation. Okay, thanks. How about you Erin? Well Soto has a very long history going back to the Great Depression of homeless populations living in, in our area. And up until about five or six years ago, it sort of was part of the, of the community. I would speak to business owners, they're like, yeah, there's always been a couple of people that lived under I-5, but they kept to themselves. And you know, I pay them 20 bucks every so often to sweep in front of our store. And then we've really seen in the last five years, just an exponential growth. And we deal not only with folks that are living in tents and in, in encampments, but also with RVs. When I started the BIA in 2014, I believe we were tracking about 75 RVs in Soto. And most of them moved every couple of days and I didn't get complaints. A lot of people, you know, and there'd be one or two 
And at the height of 2018, we had over 400. And, um, and they weren't moving and they were accumulating huge amounts of garbage and we were having really significant issues. So we try to take a two pronged approach. Uh, we try to partner with social services to make sure that we're doing our part to make, you know, to make this situation better. And as that, we have a contract with REACH, which is the homeless um, outreach program here in Seattle. And we have a dedicated SOTO outreach worker that does outreach. But we also look at ways to address, you know, the RVs was a pretty significant issue on Sixth Avenue South, where literally it was wall to wall Nobody could park to get into a business. And this is surrounding UPS. So place where there's a lot of movement of trucks and the need for trucks to park. And so we did work with the city uh, to install some time limited parking um, so that there would be the ability. And that has been very successful. Um, we have, you know, we have worked with the navigation team up until they were disbanded very closely because we understand that we need to be part of the solution, but it also is placing an unfair burden on certain businesses that have to bear. I mean, I had a business that was surrounded on three sides by an encampment and a pretty, pretty significantly um, aggressive group of folks. And they were throwing needles over the wall. I mean, it was pretty bad. And so we've, we've, we have, definitely advocated for moving encampments. We actually move encampments ourselves, which is bizarre because we have private property and encampments that are on private property we can move. Um, so, but we try to balance that with giving people time, giving them offers, you know, connecting them with social services so that they have an offer of shelter. Um, but all of that kind of came to a, you know, I would say in December of last year, we were in a manageable position. Um, businesses would call me and I'd be like, you're on the list. It might be four to six weeks, but you're on the list. And they could work with that. And then in six weeks, there would be a cleanup and then, you know, it'd go to a different area of Soto. Um, but nothing's moved in the last nine months and folks are feeling pretty abandoned by the city right now. Yeah. All right, thank you. How about Chris? Yeah, so similar to Soto, Pioneer Square has a history um, of, you know, homeless, a homeless community. Um, we have a really high concentration of social service organizations in the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, more than more than you can count on one hand. Um, in a similar to what Aaron reported, there's been a proliferation of that of homeless folks in the count um, in recent years and the COVID-19 pandemic recently has intensified that. And so part of that is, you know, the folks who would use the services in the neighborhood who would have shelter, um, those shelters are not at the same capacity in which they once were. So more people have been pushed out into the street. Um, and it really is a burden for the neighborhood overall, businesses, residents, and visitors. Um, you know, we have to, as the Alliance, push back on a perception that Pioneer Square um, is unsafe and, you know, has a, a chronic homelessness problem. It's something we recognize um, but you, we work actively to address it and um, both that perception, but also the on the ground reality. And so that looks like, um, again, the, those partnerships, especially for the on the ground piece. Um, you know, we have a partnership with uh, Don's mid team um, who have homeless outreach workers um, in their kind of footprint of their service area. And then, you know, most recently and something I kind of want to just talk about really quickly is a new program um, that's being implemented in Pioneer Square and also the Chinatown International District, which is led by an organization called the Public Defender Association, who has a long history of um, doing outreach services for folks and providing um, connectivity to those good services. And so they, the uh, Just Care kind of program is a consortium, consortium of different service providers that are working to do outreach to targeted individuals in Pioneer Square and the Chinatown International District, connect them with housing at hotels throughout King County, um, but also connect them with the services that they require for mental health treatment and drug addiction. Um, we've seen really strong success over the past uh, you know, few weeks where the Just Care team has been on the ground. Um, you know, Speaking outside of Pioneer Square, the Just Care team placed um, of many, many people who are um, under the I-5 overpass um, 
in the Chinatown International District. And as they move to Pioneer Square, they're tackling really challenging areas in the neighborhood where um, you see kind of the um, co-mingling of folks who are who have mental health problems, who have drug addiction issues, and who are experiencing homelessness, and also individuals who um, aren't necessarily homeless but are leveraging the positions that the homeless folks around them are in to um, obtain personal gain through, you know, selling drugs, um, sex trafficking, etc. So there's a lot of hope in the Just Care team, and I think. Um, We'll see more of that. And I think it'll be a good template for the city to look to um, for future programs. Thanks, Chris. How about Don? Sorry, I was writing in the chat there. Um, <laughs> to compliment what, uh, what Chris was saying, you know, uh, Just Cares is a really promising program that we've been tracking and partnering with them too. I put a link in the thing to the Seattle Times article. It talks a little bit about it. Um, it's a great program. Um, and Pioneer Square, again, uh, he, see, loan uh, Pioneer Square has seen 75 tenths uh, uh, as compared to three at this time last year. So it's just, we have seen a big population boom and those, uh, we see that kind of challenge. Um, I'll also put in the, the chat here and you can check out, um, we have an outreach team, like Chris mentioned. Um, we have about eight people on our team that goes out. This is funded by the Metropolitan Improvement District. And again, works closely with these different service providers in downtown Seattle. And uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I think we work with some of the folks who are more easily uh, uh, kind of shown back into housing and, and back on track. We partnered with the um, with the Millionaire Club to do a job program, which was which was great. We actually hired folks um, who had been experiencing homelessness onto our clean team and were able to get them jobs in downtown. Um, and that was a program. I'm not sure how many total people have come through that program, but it was fairly successful. And um, so trying to find a way that we can use our programming and our and our um, and our work that we're doing to try to uh, also plug into the needs of the people who are unhoused on our streets. But to going back to what Chris said, um, you know, you this is a really complex problem and it's gonna take a lot of money and it's gonna take a lot of time to solve it. And what we're seeing with Just Cares is that you have a personalized approach for just about every person. And you you have a, a, a motel voucher that gets them into a, a, a safe room with four walls and a lock. And then you can work with them and provide services in a way that they can hear it and, and engage with folks. It's just such a complicated process that it takes a long time. I mean, uh, 22 people were just housed last week into these motel rooms and then now this program is gonna work with them. But again, it's gonna take a long time to keep making those kind of dents in, in, in what we see in downtown Seattle. We have about, um, we had about 75 tents in, in Pioneer Square. Another big concentration of tents has been in Denny Park, which is over in South Lake Union. And then we had about, I think, 60 tents there. So um, a huge a huge number of folks to work with. Thanks, Don. I do have a question for you from the chat. And it's, what are the qualifications of your outreach team? Um, they're all, they're uh, masters at social work. Um, so there's a variety. There's some folks who are actually specialized in finding housing so they don't do as much of the outreach but they're but they're they're more on the back end trying to triage services there's folks who are out there every day um going um going and talking to folks those people are trained uh, social workers that um, that do that work okay and this question's for the panel i'll start with you don what um how do you measure satisfaction of your bia members well we have a ratepayer advisory board like all the bias and so we do uh regular meetings with that board to set metrics and uh, you know we track everything from picking up leaves and how many tons of garbage we pick up um how many we used to track every tin can we picked up i, I think we we don't do that quite anymore but um we track needles we pick up and so there's a little bit of like measuring the quantity um i think we also do a more maybe more sporadically but kind of uh, satisfaction surveys, like perception surveys. And so we'll engage folks and ask them, or do they think it's getting better or they're getting worse? We also collect a bunch of information to kind of just as a, as a radar of like what's going on in downtown. We, I mean, I, I don't talk about it a lot, but we do track, we do pick up a lot of biohazards, which include, you know, uh, human feces and things like that. We are able to kind of track that in, in real time. And so you can kind of see what's happening on the streets and what we're getting. And, and you can kind of tell if there's things that are kind of spiking or having an issue. And so we are able to look at that. Um, but again, I think it comes down to explaining kind of why you're doing what you're doing and what problems are at, in place. I think the more information folks have, the more they can appreciate the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. And, you know, cleaning is a part of it, but it's also about getting people inspired and the so other solutions that you have to fight for. All right. Thanks, Don. Liz. How do you uh, measure the satisfaction of your BIA members? Yeah, I would say um, what, what Don just said, we have tracked um, a lot of the things he mentioned. Uh, this year, we're going to actually start using the, the software that DSA uses to record all those things. So we'll have a lot more accurate data 
Uh, so we're excited to start doing that. And as far as um, the sort of general BIA satisfaction, I, I don't think, uh, I'm not really sure that the organization has done like surveys per se, um, but I would, what I'm interested in doing um, in the coming years is get, just getting more information out there. Um, for instance, what I, what I understand is that the bill that goes out to the BIA owners, owners has really no little information. Um, and so, you know, providing more information to the ratepayers about uh, what, what's going on and just providing more um, check-ins and meetings and touch points. All right, thanks, Liz. How about you, Erin? Well, as I said, we just went through a reauthorization process, which is kind of the ultimate test of, of whether we've been doing a good job or not. Um, but we, um, in addition to doing all of the communications and outreach uh, with our folks, we do um, have a survey program and an annual meeting with an opportunity for folks to weigh in and let us know. Um, and at this point, um, we continue to receive thumbs up or, or thank yous for being someone that's in the place. So, yeah. Thanks, Aaron. And Chris, the final question to you. Yeah, you know, I would say um, we don't have a formal kind of quantitative measurement system, but we really rely on that qualitative piece. So, um, you know, we're always trying to demonstrate the value uh, that the Alliance can provide to the neighborhood. And, um, you know, we see kind of um, satisfaction in the form of engagement with our activities. So whether that's, you know, open rates on emails, attendance at events, um, but also, um, you know, verbal feedback is really important too. So when you're having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with business owners, property owners, um, residents, you, you hear, you know, how they feel um, about what we're doing for the neighborhood. Um, and then I guess I would just tack on the final kind of piece for feedback that we like to loop into a lot of our programming is just a feedback form. So if we're doing an event or an activity, um, asking people how we can improve next time, um, I think that's a, always a really important question to ask, but generally it uh, really falls into that qualitative uh, category. Thanks, Chris. And I want to thank the panel for their time and their answers, and I'm going to turn it back over to Brock. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris, Don, uh, Aaron, Sheldon, Liz, for a great panel discussion about what you do and your successes and hopefully continued success as soon as COVID is over. You know, we can go back to more of business as usual for your organizations and everybody else. So um, it, it generally, you know, when we're able to do panel discussions in person, you're able to give physical gifts in person. Uh, so we'll have to figure something else out once uh, we're back to meeting in person. So thank you uh, for your time today, for sure. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, switch screens. Everybody, feel uh, panelists, feel free to stay for sure and learn more about what we've been doing. Um, but we'll shift to kind of our 2020 um, accomplishments and things that have been happening in the neighborhood. And I have to share the screen. All right. So um, I'm going to provide uh, a quick overview. Um, and, you know, things that have happened in the neighborhood, I'll start with that uh, over the past year. And I'll start with um, Everett Transit and Sound Transit were able to expand a parking uh, lot by 80 stalls on the south end of its properties on S Smith Avenue. Um, so that was one big change. And then one of our priorities in 2019 was to get new on-street parking restrictions to help address the RV uh, and um, overnight parking situation, especially south of 33rd Street on the west side of the tracks. And so we had put together a proposal for the city and the city implemented it in uh, January, February of this year. And uh, my, uh, what I'm hearing from property owners is that has worked really well. Um, uh, there's still, uh, we had to do some education as well uh, with property owners about um, that because we don't have improved right away everywhere, um, the businesses themselves often and property owners themselves have the responsibility for enforcing um, their own parking restrictions within those areas. And I think we've probably seen an improvement of that as well. Um, we'll be looking to uh, expand 
uh, that on-street parking restriction plan for the rest of the neighborhood, and we'll be gauging that conversation this spring. Um, other things that uh, ESCA isn't you know, necessarily responsible for, but have happened in the neighborhood, include um, obviously Kaiser Permanente breaking ground on their 165,000 square foot world-class facility that they're building, um, 140 new units of housing uh, built on Broadway with the Connect Apartments. Um, Everett Public Works began studying moving their campus uh, to either the Riverside property that the city owns or to property that currently it's under Everett Transit on the south end of uh, the Smith property, Smith Avenue properties. And we expect to see action on that this uh, spring. Um, and finally, uh, this is probably a little bit more broader, but affects uh, our neighborhood, which is Everett Transit continues to uh, work with uh, other city departments and a consultant and evaluating, you know, its future uh, existing funding or expanding its funding or potentially merging with community transit. And that has an effect in terms of um, our uh, future and the future in our neighborhood. So those are things that have happened in our neighborhood. Um, organizationally, COVID-19 uh, impacted some of our uh, significantly our program work. Um, we had been uh, collecting affidavits of support to, to show uh, what we believed, uh, what well, what we had in support for the uh, business improvement area that we were pursuing. Um, we had, uh, at the time of March, uh, when COVID hit, um, identified uh, of private property owners, uh, specifically nearly 60% uh, support, about 58% um, that had been identified and we were about 80% of the way through confirming uh, them through affidavits. And then COVID hit and we just stopped the, the process altogether due to the economic uncertainty of the process and the fact we uh, needed to do social distancing. And we continue to be in that holding pattern uh, of thinking of uh, the economic uncertainty uh, existing. And so we're continuing to evaluate the, the proper next steps and what uh, business and property owners would like to see moving forward in terms of services and how they'd like them provided. Um, the other effect was on staffing. Uh, in terms of financials, we, we were able to secure a PPP loan uh, to um, cover us through June, uh, but then I went to half time after that uh, to, uh, to be able to manage our, our budget for the remainder of the year. Uh, so that certainly affected what we could produce. Um, in 2019 and through uh, the spring of 2020, um, we had put together a future concepts report to lay out potential options of how uh, infill development might occur while protecting light industrial properties. Um, and that, with that report was presented at our semi-annual membership meeting in June. And then we wrapped it up uh, in October of uh, finally having a, a finished copy of it uh, to be able to lay out how the infill development might happen while protecting light industrial uses. At our June meeting, we also um, passed our first uh, official organizational statements around our mission and vision and um, continued a conversation around establishing a value statement, which later today, hopefully we adopt uh, finally. So uh, kind of really instrumental documents of saying who we are as an organization. And finally, um, we as an organization were contracted by Housing Hope to uh, assist with um, ensuring all voices were heard within their study uh, of, of putting together a proposal for an early learning child or early childhood learning facility um, and affordable housing project. And so we've been engaged in that process to pull together focus groups and do surveys and ensure our property owners are at the table. And um, that continues and will continue through uh, March. Um, so I'm going to uh, specifically highlight an update because I know this has been the main thing we've been working on. I want to make sure everybody is up to speed on it, uh, the convergence at Everett Station study. Um, so again, this is a, a study of by Housing Hope um, to look at an early childhood learning facility and affordable housing and other mixed use development um, at uh, but specifically on the parking lot across from Everett Station, and I'll show a map in just a second. And they uh, hired um, a team of consultants 
of Northwest Studio, Nelson Nygaard, MIG, and Heartland uh, to produce the study. Um, ESDA has been doing the community engagement uh, to help inform them. And then the Urban Land Institute will be doing a secondary study as part of this project um, to look at some other factors as well. Um, just a bit of background, just to make sure you know why <laughs> this is important. Um, the uh, Puget Sound Regional Council uh, through Vision 2050 has uh, targeted growth for Everett uh, to increase by 87,000 new residents and 89,000 new workers by uh, year 2050, and to prioritize that to be next to Link Light Rail, uh, which uh, is um, scheduled to arrive in 2036. Uh, and so the two instrumental documents, again, is Vision 2050, just adopted this fall, um, which prioritizes that growth near transit, um, as well as uh, the city's Metro Everett plan, which was adopted in um, 2018 and rezoned our neighborhood. Um, with the study has two sites. So first is the, the west site, which is in yellow on the screen, um, which is the parking lot. Uh, across from Everett Station. Um, and uh, this is a site that Housing Hope is most uh, interested in, in terms of thinking about uh, an early childhood learning facility and affordable housing and mixed use development. Um, it is uh, kind of in between the two station locations that have been put on the table uh, for uh, kind of officially. Um, Sound Transit's SD3 plan uh, providing a representative uh, station location, which is just south of the uh, station building within the, uh, the bus turn bays. And then the city of Everett through the Metro Everett plan uh, identified a preferred location at Pacific and, um, and McDougall. And so, you know, those are that process of determining the location is something that Sound Transit will do over the next five years. Um, but uh, those are the two identified locations and then uh, Housing Hope is looking at this block. On the east site, um, in talking with the city, uh, the city uh, about this study, the city requested uh, that the study include their east site properties um, along Cedar. And so they've been incorporated into the study for the consultants to look at as well. Um, the timeline for all of this, I do have on the timeline on the bottom, just to kind of clarify when things might happen. Um, so the, the dark blue line of schedule is Sound Transit's uh, Everett Link timeline uh, under ST3. And uh, between 2021 and uh, 2025, 2026, um, Sound Transit is scheduled to do planning work and that includes the environmental impact statement and alternatives analysis of what alignment and station location should uh, the uh, project should go to. After that, it goes into design uh, of the alignment uh, from Linwood to uh, Everett and the construction from 2030 to 2036. Uh, that's kind of in, that's totally independent of anything uh, that uh, is being that the city has control over or ESDA or Housing Hope. Um, the yellow uh, bar there uh, indicates kind of the hoped for uh, timeline for Housing Hope um, of where there's going to probably be, be three or four years of planning and design work followed by construction. Um, and funding and all sorts of things have to work out to make that work. So there's a rather large dark color of yellow or uh, solid color of yellow to indicate uh, a long period of uncertainty as to when things might happen on that front. And um, the bottom there is thinking about what would happen to the 17 acres on the east site. And that's really uncertain. Obviously, the city is going to make a decision uh, relatively soon about whether they would like to uh, move the public work site to a, a different location. Um, but the actual change of land use uh, is likely much longer uh, into the future. Um, and so hypothetically, it's, it's probably more closer towards the timing of the opening of the light rail station that that land would actually change to something else. Oh, gotta go to the right screen. 
Um, the study itself um, is uh, a it's funded under a biennial grant, so there's a two-year period. So the, the study is really just uh, ends up being compressed into uh, a year <laughs> or less um, of starting in August and then ending in March of next uh, spring um, to provide some concepts of how the sites could be developed. Um, and so a consultant from August to September, September was engaged in kind of background research and discovery. We've been doing community engagement from October to mid-November, and we will continue to do additional engagement um, throughout the process, uh, including with our property owners and industrial lands owners. Um, and then in, we expect a draft uh, report um, in early January, and we will follow up uh, probably in late January with the community open house uh, for you to provide feedback back to the consultant on the draft report, which will they will then incorporate that feedback into their final report in March. And we will do a final open house uh, on that so you can see what's in the report. So again, the two sites, um, and uh, we have had uh, eight focus groups uh, to help go through the, the specific elements of the study um, to make sure that the right people are helping to, to shape those things. But really of high importance is the industrial uh, areas and the adjacent property owners. And so uh, we made sure, even though it wasn't uh, part of the, the study's scope, that we did the focus group. We've had the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we've been doing outreach with our adjacent property owners um, and that um, we're making sure that the, uh, we're distributing the surveys to make sure that um, the concerns and needs uh, are included within the study to help shape uh, what you know, anything moving forward would look like. Um, and so that, that will continue to, as we move forward. Um, I, this is wrapping up, but um, again, the timeline here for the, the project is for anything happening is the yellow line is, is really far out and the engagement process, we're kind of still in the middle of, of doing outreach um, and stakeholder involvement. Um, ultimately, the study will come up with some alternatives of, of ways that uh, the sites could possibly uh, uh, be developed. Um, and so your input is really key to making sure it works with our adjacent property owners. And with that, um, I think that's the end of this section of kind of updates. Um, uh, Brock, let me jump in here. That'd be good. Um, <clears throat> I want to clarify how Housing Hope uh, got involved in this. Um, housing Hope is a multifaceted uh, nonprofit corporation that does housing and provides services for the people that are housed in its program programs. It is a Snohomish County uh, initiative. It's uh, involving 18 city governments and, and uh, county government. And um, one of the key programs that Housing Hope uh, operates is called Tomorrow's Hope Child Development Center which is a combination of childcare and early learning. And it's in a building that was a sizzler restaurant and uh, has seen its day. It is uh, undersized and it's um, not, doesn't have the spaces and capacity that's needed for the program. So Housing Hope was looking for a location for that program. And uh, it turns out that there are now five light rail stations in the Fidget Sound Link system that have cited early learning and childcare programs. Um, and three more that are right nearby the light rail stations. And there's legislation and funding occurring to incentivize early learning programs at light rail stations. And um, uh, quite a momentum happening in the King County area in this regard. And so Housing Hope, uh, began considering whether a light, an early learning center could be sited at the uh, near the transit center so that uh, 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 participants uh, re requiring childcare or uh, early learning programs could easily access the location. 
So it was with that interest in mind that the uh, legislature funded the Housing Hope Initiative to do a study. And in looking at the uh, location of an early learning center, it was important to consider, you know, what the, the development capacity might be, what kind of amenities uh, might uh, uh, coexist with an early learning center, uh, what the housing plan um, might encompass. And so these uh, 10 bullets here are elements that uh, were identified for the study to give better information to decision makers uh, that are interested in um, activity, uh, development activity uh, in proximity to the transit center. So Housing Help is a recipient of the funding and has contracted with Everett Station District Alliance to make sure a robust community engagement process happens and with consultants who have urban design and um, real estate development uh, capabilities and expertise. So uh, the hope was that this would involve a robust community discussion to um, figure out how to think strategically about how to benefit our property owners, the businesses that operate in the district, commuters that uh, come through this location, and programs that could be beneficial to the neighborhood and, and the broader community. So we're pretty excited that uh, this is moving ahead and we're within uh, 30 days of being able to present a draft report from the consultants to the community for a couple months of uh, discussion and dialogue then before a final report is, is completed. So look forward to an invite to a meeting in the first 15 days of January where that draft report will be presented to our community. All right, we are now to the point uh, of our business meeting. Uh, once, a, uh, once a year, we assemble in an annual meeting to accomplish um, our business of planning for our next year. And uh, we have a number of items that we wanna go through to make sure our membership is up to date. Um, so we're gonna start with the uh, financials for the year. It's been a tough year with COVID. Uh, it, there's been a lot of uh, uh, fiscal uh, challenges. It's been a hard year uh, to operate a uh, aggressive uh, fund development program. Um, so here's a look at the profit and loss for the year through November. So this is 11 months of activity. And all, you can see that uh, the largest uh, uh, component in the uh, revenue stream has been grant income. And that's largely from uh, payments to ESDA for the uh, community engagement initiative. We've had some nice sponsorships. We, we have to extend thanks to Sound Transit and Community Transit in particular for their um, ongoing support of the organization. Uh, we, um, <clears throat> the bottom line is uh, that uh, we have a deficit of $20,000, a little over $20,000. Uh, however, um, we also have a $20,600 loan under the PPP program of, CARE, of the CARES Act that has come in during this period of time. And so we're pretty close. That'll be forgiven uh, hopefully soon. So we're pretty close to break even when you factor in that element. Next slide. Uh, balance sheet. Um, we have uh, funds in our checking account and we have uh, funds coming uh, through our grants account receivable, totaling $34,500. Uh, we have some obligations uh, that uh, include uh, some payroll that yet needs to be uh, paid. Uh, we have uh, borrowed some funds. Uh, that $11,000 bridge loan has helped us with cash flow needs for the for the year, uh, that eleven thousand dollar number has been reduced to ten thousand, 
uh, we started at 14,000. So we've had $4,000 of the loan uh, forgiven uh, to support the uh, finances of the organization. Uh, you can see the PPP loan there at $20,600. Um, so it's, uh, it's a balance sheet that uh, needs to improve. Uh, that would be certainly our goal in 2021. Um, as uh, many of you know, the business improvement area was going to be one of those longer term funding uh, um, elements that would create a financial model for viability of the organization and that didn't happen in 2020. Uh, so we've had to um, patch together the finances of the organization best we could. Um, budget to actual, we had uh, uh, an approved budget of uh, $66,000. Um, we actually were at actually at uh, $40,000 essentially for the year. And that twenty thousand dollar deficit at the bottom is the uh, is covered by the PPP loan, which again is going to be uh, um, forgiven, and it is not portrayed on this budget to actual. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions on the uh, uh, financial report for the year. Anybody have any questions about the numbers? All right, so we'll move on then. We uh, again are still in COVID and we don't know how long COVID is gonna last. So um, we're uh, looking at how to uh, plan for the next year. And we've broken the year into a half a year um, first. And then uh, with the idea, we'll come back to the quarters three and four as we progress through the year. For the first half of the year, uh, we um, are going to be active in uh, securing memberships. So heads up, everybody. We uh, are ready to invite you to do your $25 membership uh, dues uh, for 2021 uh, can start anytime. We'll be active in January to try to bring as many memberships in as we can. Uh, we also have uh, uh, continuing uh, support in the form of sponsorships and donations that we've uh, experienced in our first three years and we hope that's gonna continue in year four and have targeted $20,000 for that. And uh, we have uh, $10,000 of grant money lined up to support the budget. That money is gonna go into part-time uh, staffing uh, plan. Um, I didn't mention the fiscal agent uh, situation. We have contracted in our first three years with Housing Hope to provide fiscal agent services, which is accounting, financial reports, payroll taxes, um, tax, tax return, 990 return, all of that. Um, Housing Hope has forgiven the, uh, has contributed as an in-kind contribution the fiscal agent charges for 2020. Uh, we put uh, a little bit of money. This is a, a $7,500 contract. Uh, we put a little bit of money into 2021 uh, um, with the intent of you know, keeping that uh, contracting service alive. We have uh, a Vista volunteer that uh, we've uh, enjoyed uh, for a year and a half now. And we have another year and a half available to us through that program at a cost of $7,500. So that's shown in the expenses um, for a balanced budget in the first half of the year of $32,500. This is uh, shared here for any comment or input or questions the membership may have. It will go to the board of directors at its January meeting for discussion and adoption. So any input that any participant on this um, Zoom call 
might have, now would be the time to offer your thoughts on the proposed or the draft 2021 budget. And it, it may be useful to go over the priorities on the next slide uh, for folks to engage on kind of thoughts of programming. So good, good comment because indeed this uh, this has got to deliver some goodness, and uh, there's a lot going on, and uh, this is pretty meager for to take care of uh, the uh, opportunities and and wants of the organization. So let's go to that next page. And uh, Brock, are you going to walk us through this? Sure. Um, so again, this is draft and would be uh, adopted as priorities in January. Um, so that we have a month basically to review and be able to set uh, the priorities for the next year. And um, I'm going to at, at the end of this, I'm going to pop up a, a poll that will just give some more information for the board to consider. Um, so you can provide, even if you don't want to chime in here, you'll be able to at least provide some feedback through the poll. Um, so that the first is service delivery. Um, we know that many property owners do want to see uh, a cleaner neighborhood uh, with less litter, less issues of crime, um, greater safety, more welcoming, um, potentially being able to, to market the neighborhood or have um, to be able to showcase it as a place to, to do business or for customers to come. And so, uh, our focus to start is to do a spring community cleanup this, uh, this spring, uh, date TBD, maybe multiple dates, um, of where we will uh, start, that process, uh, start that effort, um, basically uh, contracting to some extent to help us and assist us in that process, but also uh, supplementing it with volunteers from our membership um, to help get out in the community and make our neighborhood a little bit better. We will continue to explore, you know, what is the right service delivery model for uh, uh, providing services um, and figure what that should be. And so we continue to welcome input uh, into your thoughts on that. Um, we are, as a, as a neighborhood organization, um, probably our, our number one role is just to be a facilitator of uh, information and communication. Uh, uh, between property owners, uh, with the city, um, and to work towards a shared vision. Uh, so that way we can clearly articulate uh, what we want as a neighborhood um, to decision makers. And so that will remain a priority. Uh, our engagement with uh, the Housing Hope Project is part of that and making sure that our property owners and business owners are at the table. Um, and we will uh, Use other as other issues come up. Make sure that we continue to, to share information and, and bring people together. Um, since the beginning, you know, of the organization of when pe people started meeting back in 2014, uh, and then when we became a formal organization in 2017, thinking about um, development in the neighborhood has been uh, core to our discussions. Um, and uh, one big piece of that. Uh, is making sure that our existing businesses continue to thrive. And so we will continue to find uh, policy solutions that uh, work well for industrial lands folks, especially those south of 33rd and along Hill Avenue, um, as well as looking towards the future. Um, we know that there's 87,000 more people that need to be accommodated in the city. Uh, and we have a huge opportunity with light rail. Um, and although you know, 16 years away seems like a long time. It is really not. And the, the efforts for um, starting to shape what that development looks like starts this coming year with Sound Transit's EIS process, which is starting to kick off. Um, they also have a transit-oriented development um, uh, project that's just on East Link, um, or sorry, East Link, on Everett Link. And so we will want to work with Sound Transit to, uh, within that process to make sure that we're building the neighborhood we, we would like to see into the future. Um, and then the city of Everett is also updating its housing action plan, um, which uh, in, 
is branded as Rethink Housing. You may have heard of that. And we will want to make sure that um, any strategy we would like to see for infill uh, development and protecting industrial lands ends up uh, into the elements of the Housing Action Plan. Um, there's obviously the completion and maybe continuation of the convergence study and continued involvement with that. And uh, the city's plans for the public work site on Cedar Street obviously is, is a great relevance to uh, many property owners in the neighborhood. So we'll want to be engaged in that issue. Um, and I just, we just confirmed just before this meeting, I think Christina is on the call, but the city of Everett will also be uh, beginning its planning work for uh, improving the pedestrian experience from Everett Station to the arena, uh, which was funded uh, by Sound Transit um, a year, a little over a year ago. So um, we'll also be engaged in that process. There are near-term uh, issues that we will focus on um, in 2019 and then implemented this, this year at the beginning of 2020 was the on-street parking restrictions um, within the, the area south of 33rd and uh, uh, west of the Smith and West. Um, and we have committed to continuing to, to plan for those on-street parking restrictions uh, elsewhere in the neighborhood. Um, and so we will do that this coming uh, spring um, and continue to uh, have that dialogue with business owners and the city of Everett regarding the safety and camping along Smith Avenue. Um, I think, you know, we need to continue to make sure that we have uh, police and others uh, coming to the table there. And then finally, um, uh, we just went through the budget. We continue needing to do organizational development, so that will be a priority uh, going forward. So those are the, the big priorities. Um, Ed, do you want to add anything more to our priorities list? And well, there's there's uh, a lot more that we could be doing, and um, how much we actually do in each of these five areas is going to be uh, contingent to some degree on our uh, financial uh, capacity. So you got to set uh, limits and just. Uh, spend time where it's, it's a priority. So these are uh, aspirational in some regards. I think there's a lot of it that we can do if we can fund ourselves at least minimally uh, with the part-time uh, plan that is uh, being proposed. But we would very much like your uh, comments and input. Uh, um, and uh, Brock has got the poll up now. So shall we just take a couple minutes Brock and that people focus on, the participants focus on uh, the, the question at hand. Sure, that'd be great. And, you know, we're, we'll take this, we won't have a big dialogue of the results here. We'll take this information and share it back with the board. Um, but I definitely wanted, I know not everybody's probably going to speak up. So I want to make sure you have the opportunity to weigh in somehow uh, within uh, this process. So let's just take a minute and let you focus on that. And uh, please help, help us by, uh, uh, filling filling out the poll with your your thoughts. All right, let's uh, open this up for any comments. Uh, this is uh, a neighborhood that all of you that are on this call uh, are interested in um, uh, succeeding in being an asset to our city and to the neighborhood for 
uh, goodness that is going to happen. Change is on its way, whether we uh, like that or not. Um, and uh, we're uh, interested in having a say in what that change looks like over time. And we'd like to build as much consensus as possible. We want to build as much collaboration as possible. Um, so anybody uh, want to weigh in with a comment or a question or a suggestion? Yeah, I would, Ed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is that, is that okay. Neil? Okay. Yeah, it's Neil. Um, after looking at the the map layouts of you know what housing host planning and what the city of Everett is, you know potentially planning on the east side, it appears that the uh, property is direct, directly across from the housing hope site, which is ours, which is our MJM Properties Company, uh, is not uh, in, is not shown as one of the industrial area uh, improvement areas. So I guess we can look forward to some sort of change for our property as well. Well, what, whether that be you know, us moving our company or moving JMC cabinets or, you know, repurposing this property in some way. Yeah, my comment, the response to that would be that uh, the convergence study is focused on those two areas that have boundaries. It is not um, uh, proposing changes or uh, development activity or, or even uh, focused study uh, beyond that. Um, we understand that these two sites um, will affect the properties that are adjacent, and that is a piece of the work that is intended between now and March for discussion with property owners that are adjacent to these two sites to think strategically about or to understand what the impacts are going to be and think strategically about um, solutions and um, and strategies uh, for a win-win scenario. Um, beyond that, ESDA is in, in the belief that uh, all businesses and, and properties uh, in the neighborhood are an asset and that they uh, should not be forced to change their business models and alter their, their plans that the ESDA is there to support them in succeeding where they're at and with the business that they are now doing, but available to those property owners that want to change their business model if and when that happens. We think, think. that we think that the industry and manufacturing can coexist with uh, residential development if done in smart and strategic ways and carefully thought out and in collaborative mode. So uh, your property is across the street from this site. It could be impacted. You are going to be invited to a meeting with the other property owners that are adjacent to discuss who you're thinking on um, you know, this project and what it is um, um, gonna, gonna likely, what the recommendations are gonna be when this project study is done. So, it's a, it's a process that I think will allow business and property owners to be a part of figuring out a good way to let the neighborhood grow over time into uh, uh, its future. Yeah, I definitely look forward to that. So, okay, that's good. it. Good question. Other comments? Um, I can maybe just go over the poll results. I don't know if I, uh, I'm running on two screens and they, the, I'm not sure how it quite shows up on your screens, but um, obviously uh, the number, let's see, are the top things that folks were interested in. Um, the number one was at the very bottom of developing a service delivery program to provide the cleaning, safety, and neighborhood marketing desired by property and business owners, um, and you know, not too far behind at 
50 percent of the respondents included um, developing a plan for meeting the needs of the chronically unhoused in the neighborhood and then um, planning for transit oriented infill development that's sustainable equitable and prosperous and uh, then facilitating conversations with property owners about key issues facing the neighborhood uh, i'll be I, i'm kind of surprised that there more people didn't vote for um, thinking about industrial lands a little bit more. Um, I Maybe it's just the wording and the thinking through it of, of how that might be done, but, um, you know, thinking about is, is the zoning working for people? How do we preserve freight corridors? Those sorts of things seem like they will continue to need to be at the, uh, at the table uh, even when we're doing like planning for transit-oriented infill development. Um, and so um, it's a, it kind of maybe a surprise to me uh, that was so low, but all good information. And um, if you have additional thoughts, feel free to email me or Ed or board members um, with your thoughts so that way we can continue that conversation and bring it before the board in January. Um, okay. Well, thank you for that input. And uh, like Brock says, feel free to communicate your thoughts. Uh, best done probably to him over the next few weeks so that the board of directors can have as much uh, information as possible from stakeholders, members, property owners, business owners, and the like. Okay. All right, we have two action items for uh, today. Um, this is going to be for members. So if you are a dues paying 2020 member, oh, there's the list. Um, thank you, Brock. Uh, if you are a member, then you would be asked to vote on these uh, two items. Um, you could try to get an emergency membership for 2020 by going to the link I provided earlier in the chat of everettstationdistrict.com slash memberships um, if you want to vote on it right now. Um, and you can also pay for next year's memberships uh, if you would like. So. Um, you mean you can get a twofer? You, or, <laughs> you get a twofer. But, but, uh, that take, but that takes 50 bucks, right? That takes 50 bucks, that's right. All right, well. We encourage people to do that because it'll help us get through 2020 and to get us started in 2021. Um, I'm going to start here and then Ed, you can do the, the, uh, the call for votes here. But the first action item is our value statement. And this has been a, I don't, like a 10 month process of getting to a statement to where we're at now. Um, we adopted these three statements in June of our mission, vision, and purpose statement. We left a fourth because we felt like it needed more conversation. Um, and we did two, uh, two surveys to our membership. We had several meetings, covered it over several board meetings of what our value statement should be. And we amended what we showed in, um, in June to now uh, read uh, these six principles. Um, and uh, the board is making a recommendation to the membership to adopt uh, this value statement um, as how we will operate as an organization and how we will communicate who we are uh, to the world. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Ed. So there have been a lot of uh, proposed value uh, words that have been discussed in a series of meetings. And I think the board of directors has had this on its agenda three or four times since June uh, when at our semi-annual meeting, it was reviewed and, and sent forward for more work. Um, so I'm just gonna read these um, just to make uh, it uh, 
embedded in our minds. So the first one is respect. We respect the opinions of all stakeholders. Stakeholders are property owners. They are business owners. They are uh, uh, commuters. Um, <clears throat> and they are um, uh, the broader community that cares about its transit center. Uh, so there's a lot of voices and we feel like everybody should be heard. And uh, that's uh, done through respect for anybody's input. Collaboration, we achieve more by working together. We uh, started this organization because we felt like uh, the neighborhood needed a voice and that uh, working together and building consensus was the way to impact uh, the work of our public jurisdictions and um, solutions to the issues in our neighborhood. Transparency, we engage in clear, robust, and timely communication to establish a bedrock of trust and confidence. That's a uh, very important value um, that uh, nobody is gonna be trusting uh, the work of the organization unless it's transparent and can be understood. Sustainability, a healthy environment is crucial to well-being and prosperous businesses. Uh, prosperity, we support the success of existing and future businesses and people. Equity, we embrace diversity, promote equity, and invite inclusion of all people in our community. So this has been hard work of a key uh, number of people in, in the neighborhood. It's presented today uh, for uh, approval. And then it, together with the mission statement, vision statement and purpose statement, this will help us um, <clears throat> tell those who are interested in knowing who we are exactly what we stand for. So I need a motion and then I need a second and then we'll have discussion. So moved. All right, thank you, Neil. Can I have a second? Second. Christina. Yep. Uh, thank you for it's been moved and seconded. Uh, it's open for discussion. Any comments? Ed, this is Tom Hinkson. I will uh, concur with you that this has been nearly a year of conversation and really robust uh, discussion, thoughtfulness, and I believe that it is a good representation of who we are, what we stand for, and how we see our future. So I certainly support adopting it. Thank you, Tom. Other comments? Yeah, this is Eric Ashley Vinko with Sound Transit. Um, I just like to applaud the process. Um, having put together many of these statements throughout my years of work, it's not an easy thing to do and it's rather tedious at times, but uh, to see the, the time and effort everyone put into this is great. So also uh, look forward to adopting this today. Thank you, Eric. Other comments? Anybody else have a comment? Question? If not, then we're gonna put this to the vote. Um, I'm going to ask uh, those who uh, approve it to say aye and those that uh, uh, do not want to approve it to say no, or uh, you can abstain. So this is for members only. All those in, uh, in favor of approving the uh, mission, vision, purpose, and values as presented, say aye. 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 And anybody opposed say no.
Anybody abstaining, say so. It is uh, hereby approved by unanimous uh, vote of the membership. Thank you. We have one more slide. Uh, this is the uh, look at the current board of directors. Uh, and again, it's a staggered term. So we have four members listed at the top in the top area that whose terms are expiring in 2020. There are three members who have one more year on their terms. There are four members who have two more years on their term. There were uh, three members that were brought on for temporary to fill in a vacant uh, term uh, that are shown on the bottom. So uh, basically the four on the top whose terms are expiring and the three on the bottle who, bottom whose initial terms are expired. And here's the list of seven, uh, seven individuals plus one addition. And that would be Lark Kester Key. Um, we've had a representative from the United Way. They, their building is at the corner of 32nd and McDougall. They've been active in the organization, uh, but their executive director has moved on. And uh, Lark Kesterke is the new executive director of the United Way. So she's been asked if she would be willing to join the board <clears throat> in our 15th uh, slot and um, uh, begin uh, uh, serving as of January 1. So there are eight names who uh, have all agreed to serve for a new three-year term. And I need a motion um, uh, motion to approve and then a second and then I'm going to ask if there are any other nominations from the from the floor. So let's start with a motion to approve. I move to approve the slate of candidates proposed. Guy Farrell, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Is that Neil? Yes, it is. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any nominations uh, from the floor? Are there any nominations from the floor? For a third time, are there any nominations for the floor? I'll therefore call the uh, uh, nominations to a close and put this for, to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Any abstentions? Excellent. We have a 15 person board of directors, duly elected um, with staggered terms. Um, so we are well positioned for the governance of the organization. Uh, moving forward. All right, again, reminder that uh, we're going to have an active uh, membership campaign. If you know people in the neighborhood or uh, stakeholders interested in our transit center, um, please invite them to become members of the organization. And uh, remember to do your own renewals uh, during the rest of December or early in January. Brock, is there anything else that uh, we need to cover today? No, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's been obviously a trying year for everyone and all of our capacities. Um, and uh, I, the, the future of the neighborhood, I think continues to be bright, especially with so many initiatives happening. Um, and it would just be critical that we continue to be at the table in those conversations and help that future. So uh, thank you and uh, best holidays to you and uh, hopefully safe holidays. All right, we are hereby officially adjourned two minutes early. Bravo.